Meeting is streaming live now. Good morning, everybody. How's it going? Not Welcome yet. to Musician's Mindset with Jeff. Not yet. Not yet. What do you need, lovey? Well, I can see the meeting, but I'm not a part of it. Oh, they're, they're not going to Yes, you are. We see you. Is you Jeff, are a part of it. Good? Oh, okay. Part of it? So why? I, don't, oh. I can see you guys, but I... Oh, okay. I, I see it's switching back and forth to screens. All right. I guess I'm... Oh. We're not live yet, are I we? Didn't, we are. Caleb says we're not. We are, David? David? I think so. I'm Jeff's older sister. Jeff, yeah, we're sister. live. Only, Guys, only... we are on. Yay. Okay, I'm out of here. Okay. Your IT guy is leaving the building. <laughs> Hello, oh, everyone. Caleb. And welcome. Caleb. This is the musician Thank mindset. You, Thank you, Caleb. Thank you, Catherine. Hi, everyone. And welcome. This is uh, episode one of Musician Mindset with Jeff and Coop. Hey, Coop. Hey, Jeff. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, good. How are you? Are you in quarantine in your uh, your basement? <laughs> I am. They've locked. They locked me in here. Actually, Mike. they won't even let you up to the rest of the house, right? Yeah, and only with for playing uh, Fortnite. I can get out virtually. How you doing? God, I can't complain, man. It's a beautiful day here. I've got these windows. I can look out at the lake and. Um, you know, it's sunny, so it's really nice. And I just did a Instagram live, uh, fireside chat. So I, I talked to Danielle Kuhlman and it's yeah. up there on my Instagram live. I mean, she's got some really positive things to say about the horn and about her mindset and how she approaches the horn. Um, yeah, it's just really fun to hear her talk. So, uh, that's awesome. That's that maybe the first thing we can talk about. We have David Ohanian standing by. We will hey, maybe, David, bring... David this is David. Can you David, hear me? David. You. Can, can you hear me? I'm, yeah, I'm really not... well. Oh, great. Hi, Dave. Nice to meet you, vir even virtually. Yeah, I know. This is our first time actually meeting. This is a, Yeah. I'm... Yeah. Uh, I grew up listening to the Canadian Brass, so this is a huge honor for me. Wow. That's, that's well, my, um, that seems like ancient history, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be really enjoying this as a, as a listener, probably more, at, at least as much as a participant. Yeah, well, excited yeah. to get your stories on all of this, David. Yeah, do you have any? So maybe we dive in and talk about David for a minute, uh, and then we had some technical excitement getting online, so we uh, stumbled on online with our, our special guest right away. So let's start with David. Maybe talk for about a half an hour, and then maybe Coop and I can share some other, take some other questions on Facebook. Absolutely. Um, or we we'll just take this, this right, first well, episode to. So yeah, David. About, yeah. I was thinking about, uh, you know, your, your invitation and the request to talk about a little about uh, what I, uh, what I grew up, what the influences were on me. And I know that, um, maybe talk you know, I realized, maybe Coop and I but, can share some other takes. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> your, yes, David. Uh, Go ahead, and it was uh, like, I mean, I realized that I'm from a different generation uh, now and and uh, I thought I would talk about the influences that I had when I was, uh, a, you know, a young player and student and a young player. One of the things, um, you know, uh, the, the the top orchestra players, of course, were, were on my mind. And there was uh, there was Jimmy Chambers in New York. There was Mason Jones in Philadelphia, Myron Bloom in Cleveland. And um, uh, what did I say? And uh, Phil Farkas in in Chicago, and the uh, nobody nobody really mentioned the Boston brass section. So for some reason, I went to Boston. Um, I actually had heard the Boston Symphony live in New York, and and uh, appreciated what I heard there. But so I ended ended up going to going to Boston, but. The two probably most formative uh, players in my uh, upbringing were not orchestral players, but they were very fine players in their own right. And they were, those were John Barrows and Vince DeRosa. When I'd hear, hear these guys play, uh, they, they was, it was quite magical. And of course, uh, I don't know, few people really... Uh, 
talk about them, it seems, anymore. But Barrows was a, a very versatile player, and he I, heard, I knew about his playing through uh, the recordings of the Alec Wilder sonatas and some other chamber music, New York Woodwind Quintet. And he had a, a magical uh, uh, musical approach, fabulous sound. And, uh, and Vince DeRosa was just a commercial player. Um, he played in, uh, on, on the, the, the TV shows that I watched. He played movie soundtracks. He did uh, an album with Lorendo Elmeida, the guitarist, playing some Bach pieces. And he did a lot of stuff, but not symphonic stuff. But those two guys, to me, represented American horn playing more than uh, any anyone else at that time. Now we're talking, you know, uh, the uh, early '60s and uh, g going into the '70s. So it was a it was a bit of a different approach for me. I mean, as far as recordings, there was Dennis Brain. That was pretty much the only recording. You know, there were no Radovan Vlatkovich and uh, and Herman Bauman, they, they just did, weren't out there. Even Tecla had not really started recording yet. So if I wanted to listen to a horn soloist or wanted to listen to a Mozart or a Strauss concerto, it was Dennis Brain. That was it. So if you're, I mean, this is great, great. And these names, and we can find these recordings on and the young players that are listening now, what kind of stuff would you want to uh, tell them for their mindset on training or what you had to listen to? And, look, sorry. Getting ahead, I would like to share with the, if anyone who doesn't know, this is Dave Ohanian who played what twelve years in the Boston Symphony. Yeah, as third yeah. horn and a founding member of Empire Brass, and twelve years in Canadian Brass, and he's been quite a thing to shake on my shoulders because he's very famous in this quintet called Canadian Brass that I'm in now because he memorized everything while after one reading and every time I take eight weeks to memorize something well David could do it <laughs> so I, it's a love-hate relationship with David welcome yeah. David uh, but as far as your mindset on on getting into music and what today's artists could be doing to get a career in music what would you tell them to do more of and dive into and that you did or would do well i think that you need to know the standard that's out there and so i think listening yeah. to as much as you can is probably the most important thing i mean i'm uh i'm blown away by the uh american horn quartet guys yeah and um that that to me that they're they have notched it up a level that uh is was beyond really my comprehension when I was growing up as a student. Certainly the, uh, I think uh, overall, the level of playing, orchestral playing has gone up in orchestras. The, the, the brass playing, the string playing, uh, everything, uh, the ensemble. The conductors have not gotten better in my judgment. <laughs> in fact, I think they're not as good, but maybe that's because of my perspective. That's so, my sister laughing in the background. She married Dave Ohanian and she plays second bassoon in the Boston Symphony. Hi, Suzanne. Yeah, yeah. She just went upstairs again. She just came down to oh, give okay. us a laugh and then she retired again. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> she was giggling back in the background. background. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that that's uh, that's sort of my general outlook. I uh, I, I certainly uh, think that listening to what it is that you want to do is very important and if you want to be an orchestral player do that if you want to be a soloist do that if you want to be a, a chamber player then you do that but um i think it helps to find input from all different possible sources well i think the question i had for you is how do you decide that you want to be a horn player in general i mean like first of all like how do you decide that like music professional music is like a path that you can pursue and that you'd actually you know I mean, how did that work for you? It worked uh, for me. I was from a family of musicians, as Jeff is. My father was a music uh, teacher, violinist, and public school music teacher. My mother was a pianist, organist, and uh, also taught. So music was uh, in my house when I was growing up. It was in my in in my ear um, when I was, uh, and then uh, so I I found horn fairly early on and. When I was 16, I won a scholarship to study in Fontainebleau with Nadia Boulanger's school over there. And so I was exposed to um, really excellent uh, 
instrumentalists, singers, uh, and, and uh, that sort of raised the bar for me right there because I was I was part of that, and that was I, at, at age sixteen. That was a big thing. So uh, I know I know that my father used to say um, that as a music teacher, you don't want to encourage people to go into music. What you want to do is appreciate, make them appreciate music, have them give them the opportunity to appreciate music and to be consumers of music. That you should only go into, into music when you just don't want to do anything else more than you want to do that. Wow. Then you're, then, then it's a, the, a draw that is irresistible. Wow, that's great advice for young people. I mean, just like obviously listen more and love it. And then if you can't do anything else but play music, then you know pursue it like you wouldn't pursue anything else. Yeah, that's exactly. That brings right. up a big a big thing I see going on too with current teaching. Um, people might call it this generation or whatever. That there are so many things they can do, and they grow up excelling and being very good at a lot of things. But I think also maybe what you're saying, David, is that there comes a time where you have to. Also, you have to cho choose to get, if you're doing 10 things and you put your time to it, they get this good. If you put yeah, all that yeah. time into one thing, then it can be good enough for you to play professionally or be able to make a career doing music, which is what has been amazing for the three of us. But there's yeah. a point where people who are good at a lot of things, you got to choose one thing and let go of the other things. Go to that one thing so much that you end up letting go of the other things. But that's yeah, that yeah. passion of excellence. What what you just uh, described there uh, kind of reminded me of the story of Charles Kavalowski, who was the principal horn in Boston before Jamie Somerville. So like from 72 to 97, I guess he was, he was principal. And uh, Kavalowski was an amateur horn player and he studied with Chris Luba and a bunch of other people, Chris uh, but he, he was actually a uh, uh, nuclear physicist, literally a nuclear physicist and he worked in Spokane um, he taught and he and, and at night in, you know instead of coming home and playing with model trains he would take this horn and go into the closet and you know and practice because he was fascinated with it it was a, like kind of a, a, the ultimate mathematical uh, uh, computation for him to to become a horn player and eventually he he study with different people and they didn't want to teach him anymore and he kind of realized that he was so good that he didn't really have to study with people anymore and he wanted to kind of put himself in play so he he auditioned for um i guess it was uh spokane symphony and san francisco san francisco and boston all at the same time and uh, uh eventually came to boston so uh, he he was he was already established in his career, but he loved the horn and he loved playing so much that it pulled him into a completely different career, sort of in mid career. Huh. And that attention to detail served him in two passions yeah. to a yeah. high enough level, right? Yeah. Very similar thing, the learning aspect of it. Mm -hmm. How about you, David? Well, well Dave, I really wanted to know how did you get involved with the Boston Symphony? I mean, can you tell us a little bit how you made your transition from being a student into a professional realm and um, what that leap was like for you? And then, you know, I mean, assumably Boston Symphony wasn't your first audition? No, uh, no, it wasn't. It wasn't my first audition. Uh, actually, Chicago Symphony was my first audition. Right. Jeez, yeah. And uh, uh, I ended up winning that audition. So at the oh. same time, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're not you're not like the rest of us who've taken like 40 auditions. No, I, I guess I had success early on. I uh, this is the story starts a little bit before that because when I I came to Boston because I wanted to study with Staliano. I thought that he had a certain magic when he played, and I wanted to study that. Now, people, if you were a brass player, if you were a promising brass player, you didn't go to study in Boston in, in 1963 when I started school as a freshman. You went to Juilliard or you went to Curtis or you went to um, uh, maybe uh, Indiana, but you didn't go to Boston because that was not the great, a great brass section there. But somehow I, I went there and in this, I had a girlfriend in New York City. And so in the summers I went to work in Giardinelli uh, music uh, repair place in New York City. And I heard 
uh, as I was repairing trumpets and French horns, I heard these players come in who were making, you know, big money freelancing in New York. And I was thinking, you know, they don't sound that that much better than I do. <laughs> I, I think there's a chance for me. So I, uh, I was encouraged by that. And then uh, I was, I graduated from, from college, uh, from a New England conservatory. And I was, I was freelancing. So I was sort of the top uh, uh, call in Boston at the time. So I was freelancing for a couple of years during that, that couple of years. Um, the, the Chicago audition came up. I took it and, um, and I, I ended up winning it. Um, and at the same time, Boston offered me a position because their horn section was in turmoil at the time. And I ended up choosing Boston. So I, I may be the only brass player that's ever won the Chicago Symphony audition that didn't take the job. <laughs> oh my gosh, man. Wow, that's great. What, what position was it in Chicago? Well, it was the opening was for assistant, but after I won the audition, they liked what they heard and they said, you're in, on track for associate. Wow. But I never got to play with them. Man, <laughs> I mean, it would have been a different story. You'd be here in Chicago uh, now and we'd be, you know, doing a, you yeah. know, an actual in person. Right. Well, we wouldn't be doing it in person with the quarantine, but. You know, so. And I've talked, you know, I, uh, since. We'd have Dale period, on as the, as the Canadian brass hornist, I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I've since, uh, you know, gotten to know Dale a little bit and I've talked with him and, and, uh, Actually, we played together in uh, su uh, Super World Orchestra in Japan. And out to dinner one night, we were walking home, and he said, you know, you made a mistake by not coming to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the greatest compliments I had ever received. <laughs> wow. wow. So after you got in the Boston Symphony, you played with many of the great conductors. I'm sure you probably worked with like Seiji Ozawa a bit. I'm sure you worked yep. with um, like many of the up and comers. Uh, did Bernstein ever conduct Boston at that time? Bernstein conducted a lot. And uh, uh, I actually came in under Steinberg who, who William Steinberg yeah. was music director for two years. Uh, and I came in, he, he brought in a lot of people. There was about 10% of the orchestra that came in under in that two years. Uh, Bernstein came a lot, and I always felt that Bernstein was the greatest conductor that I ever worked under, and I had worked under a lot mm. uh, in, in my career. And, the re and people ask me that, and they say, who was the best conductor? And I say, it was Bernstein. And they say, why? And I think the reason is that as professional players, we know what we're capable of. We know the envelope in which we can operate, and we don't go outside that envelope because we know what we can do and we, we know what our limitations are. And sometimes those limitations are quite large, but we don't want to go outside them. Bernstein got these great performances because he would constantly try to pull you out of your envelope and say, go for it, take a chance. I'll love you no matter what happens, oh. but I want you to go for it. Like you've never gone for it before. And, and that's how he got these performances that were like 110, 120% of what the orchestra was normally capable of because he, gave you that confidence that you could go outside your comfort zone and go for it. And he would still love you no matter what happened. It might strike out, you might hit a home run, but either way, he was going to love you no matter what. Isn't that, that was, great? That was That's amazing. <clears throat> yeah. Did you wow. take that, how did you, you took that to chamber music as well? In what ways did you do that? You must've kept that with you when you went in for Empire and then your, all your years with Canadian Brass. Well, the, well, the difference with, Chamber music is that you that you have no conductor. You're the conductor. You know, yeah. you're, you're the performer and the conductor at the same time. You shaping you're shaping the performance and you're and you're contributing to that performance. So I did take I did I think it's fair to say I did take a bit of that because uh, what you uh, want to always do is go for the best possible output that you can, as if you're playing 110% every time you play. Otherwise, you can't have respect for yourself. Yeah, David, um, may I ask a question? When you yeah. started playing brass quintets professionally, um, the repertoire wasn't that large. And I'm just thinking it must have been a little bit daunting to leave this really secure major orchestra job and say, you know what, I've got this quintet that I really like, and I believe in it, and I'm going to quit playing in a 
orchestra and getting a check every week. Yeah. How did you how did you take that leap of faith? And also, could you talk a little bit about um, adding to the repertoire so you had more music to play? It was exactly that. It was a leap of faith. And uh, my my father, who was a child of the Depression, uh, thought I was making a big mistake. His dream as a violinist was always to be in the Boston Symphony. He was from Boston and he never was good enough. Um, my, my wife was, at my, my then wife was not too happy about it either because she had uh, the uh, kid and the house and the white picket fence and that was just fine with her. And uh, I, but I had this thing inside of me that just said, okay, well, I can see through this tunnel the rest of my life if I stay in the Boston Symphony. I, can, I know exactly what to expect. And I'd been in it for, you know, 10, 10 11, 12 years. And I, I said, uh, I, I just believed in myself enough to, to make that leap of faith and to believe that what we had was going to carry me on to the next phase of my life. Wow. Um, the, with respect to the repertoire, it's true. Uh, the music written for brass chamber music is either very old or very new. And, and since the, about the 50s, uh, the music for brass um, has been, it's been a composer's form uh, up until like the, the 1970s and uh, it explored new sounds and diff different combinations and different techniques and uh, that a brass quintet, which was a, you know, a recognized format, but the, the music was all either very new or very old, you know, Petzl, Holborn, Samuel Scheidt, or it was uh, Boza and uh, Malcolm Arnold and and composers that were you know contemporary mostly living composers. That's um, uh, sort of how uh, Empire started. We we started by doing things what we thought better than anybody else had done them, but it turned into uh, a, a forum for new sounds as well. And mm. then uh, the influence of the Canadian brass was was. Uh, irrefutable at that time and what they did is they just played music that they liked and they transcribed almost everything and audiences seemed to like it and after all you know you, you have to uh have an audience uh for your product and they developed that idea of having uh, of playing music that was had lasting value even though it wasn't for original instruments it was it was music that was good music it's like Fiedler used to say, he says, there's, there's only two kinds of music, good music and boring music. And we didn't want to play boring music. <laughs> wow. Uh, Jeff, I mean, I know you took that leap of faith too. I mean, how scary was that for you to leave the Vancouver Symphony, which was, you know, I mean, Canada, like probably like one of the most beautiful places in the world. And it's a fantastic orchestra job. And then all of a sudden you're just like, you know, here yeah. I am, you know, I'm gonna, right. I'm, but I mean, I think at that point, the Canadian Brass is really a, a, a legendary, you know, group. Are you asking or are you telling, David? Do you, you can't answer your own <laughs> questions here. I got to start the grief giving at some point, <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, it was definitely that. It was a very easy choice. I had been playing fourth horn in Vancouver for three years, and then I had won the principal position and was going to go back there to play principal. And Bramwell Tovey was now a longtime friend. He had written pieces for us with Canadian Brass after he was about to be the music director in Vancouver and we were going to be working together. And then I had to call him in August and say, actually, I'm not coming, but here's why. And he was like, ah, oh, I, I understand. Go for it. And it was a very easy leap to a dream more as a brass player than as I mean, as a Canadian, it was just I got to meet these guys and then to get to play. It's an incredible dream and an incredible opportunity to keep bringing that repertoire growth opportunity forward to the world and all these things that you know i think you and i david cooper are going to talk about throughout um our podcasts together sharing that but yeah chamber music has been such a vehicle we're fortunate uh, at this time as well I and mean, what's happening with orchestras versus for us we could luckily move our concerts and we're we're doing these events and can kind of turn a little bit more agilely than an orchestra can change directions yeah. and change um, principles Dave, so that 
would, would you mind talking a little bit about the differences between Empire Brass, which was a newly established group, and then um, joining Canadian, which was maybe more of a well-oiled machine? I've never heard of what what is it called? I'm <laughs> Umpire, Umpire Brass. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Empire Brass was, was basically formed out of uh, the uh, uh, a group of people that were at Tanglewood. And uh, the, the nucleus of it actually was when um, uh, the tuba player and when the trumpet player went to, were asked by Bernstein to go to um, uh, Washington to premiere his Bernstein's mass. Um, they, they played uh, the mass. And there was actually three of, the, three of the players there. They played the mass and then, uh, and they were rehearsing it and and then at intermissions they they just pass out brass quintets and and uh, pl you know play some chamber music. Oh oh, there it is. Oh man, there's Sam. Hey, where where to there's, go? Wow, that's, look at that. That's uh, Charlie Lewis on the left. Yep, and Charles Medvig on the right. Both were yep. in, in members of the uh, mass, and and Sam of course was also. They were in the mass. Wow, look uh, at that. The Bernstein mass. And uh, that's actually a picture of Mark Lawrence playing trombone. He was wow. a substitute member for a year. Uh, fabulous player who's, who uh, spent his career playing principal in San Francisco. Um, and so uh, when that group came back to Boston, they, uh, they started, uh, uh, they, they wanted to fill in a horn player. And so they called me. I was newly in the Boston Symphony. And I said, sure, I'd love to play some brass chamber music. So that was the formation of the group. And so because we were for, sort of uh, in, in orbit around the Boston Symphony, uh, it was assumed that we were formed out of the Boston Symphony, but actually during the time that uh, from the beginning of the group, I was the only member of the Boston Symphony, then Rolf Smedvig uh, won a position in Boston, and then Norm Bolter, the trombone player, won a position in Boston. So that it, it became known as a group that was formed out of the Boston Symphony, but it can't actually happened the other way around. The members were members of Empire and then became members of the Boston Symphony. Uh, we, but, but the influence was strong and the Boston, uh, the symphonic influence was strong because we wanted to sound like a little orchestral section. We wanted to blend and do a lot of uh, 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 note matching and sort of get into each other's sound the way uh, uh, an orchestral section does. And uh, the, when, I, when I transitioned to um, Canadian brass, their sounded different and that was okay. Uh, they, had a, they had a blend, but it, you get deeply into the, uh, and, uh, the sound of the group and analyze the group. They all sounded very different. The tuba uh, playing in Canadian brass, Chuck's tuba is uh, a much smaller, more compact, lighter sound. And uh, the trumpet players were much more of a soloistic kind of uh, sound with a lot of core rather than uh, an orchestral sound where you try to get the, the widest kind of sound that you can. So it was different. I, I think it's, it's a pretty fine difference if you're just listening to the group, but their, their ability to play together and to sort of move like a school of fish, uh, how you don't, you know, or, or a flock of birds where they all, move in a different direction exactly together was quite astounding. And that was a, a, a very admirable quality. One that I learned a lot, I learned a lot from that group. Learned a lot from both groups. You contributed a lot as well. Uh, how many albums do you know? Uh, 25, I think, 25. during the time, including repackagings. Yeah, about These 25. are my... My sister's two favorite pictures of you. Is it still sharing? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. <laughs> and then Suzanne, there's your favorite. <laughs> oh, yes, I love that one. <laughs> yeah. We were all pretending to be different oh, composers yeah. at the time. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah, that was quite a leap to to join, but it was thank you for doing that, David. It's yeah. So what would you tell what would you tell someone? Going, uh, doing their chamber music now as far as diving into mattering and giving some value? Well, I know that, I know that 
the Canadian brass um, philosophy was always that, you know, we, we tried to play music that we could be proud of, but also that audiences would appreciate. And I think that in that regard, we, uh, we had only scratched the surface of what is possible. Mm. Um, and you see that in groups like, uh, Kale, Kale, what's the Dutch group? Kale, oh, uh, Calix or, um, Oh, Calix. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, K- no, sorry. Calif- Califax. Cal- Califax. Yeah. It's a group of woodwind players woodwind. that, Quint. that, uh, play, Wind, you know, orchestral arrangements and different interesting sounding music. Uh, very unusual collection of players, but fabulous uh, musicianship and fabulous ensemble playing. Yeah. So that that's another example. I mean, it's a wide open field. You can just what if, if you have playing something that you believe in and that that you uh, really is good quality uh, material. You can make uh, a, a contribution to the world of chamber music yeah. with that. Could we take a couple questions from the air? Um, Lisa Nelson, um, Jeff, do you know who this is? Uh, I don't Lisa, know who that. Lisa, Lisa depends, had depends asked on the a question. question about um, how to be joyful and happy while you play something from memory on stage and not just constantly worrying about, am I gonna you know, hit the, the fork in the path? It seems like memorization is easier for you than some, but um, could you talk a little bit about your memorization of the shows with Canadian? About, about my? memorization yeah memorization was never a problem for me in fact uh uh i i don't know i never really tried to memorize something but i i just don't understand how if you hear a piece a few times you don't know how it goes you know it's and, if, and if you know how it goes then you just, yeah. you just play it wow jeff yeah. maybe maybe that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> How does My approach is like? more listening to the piece 8,000 times and getting, so there you get that first bar memorized and then another 8,000. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, no, for me. Know. It's having it on the background so you live with it. You know, but anyway, we, David, go ahead. Please did, give us your process. Yeah. <laughs> we did do, uh, in Canadian Brass, we did play a lot of things from memory and uh, it, sometimes uh, I remember... <laughs> I don't think Gene Watts is listening, but he he would forget how his part goes. So if I was resting, I would just play his part until he got back on track, and then and then I'd play my own part again. And he was he was constantly astounded as how I could do that. I said, I don't I don't know what you mean. I just you I hear all the parts, and I hear how my part fits with that. So when something's missing, I hear that it's missing, and I just fill it in. That's just awesome. like that. David, I just, I used to really like you. It's really nice. <laughs> We're clear now. <laughs> huh? My reading so, skills are very poor, but my memorization is excellent. Yeah, man. So, and is there a thing you did early on, maybe that you could akin to being able to literally like, play by ear? I think I can sing the other parts, but I can't have the right mm. buttons down. And that's quite an inhibitor. Huh. But is there uh-huh. that's, early... that's a good point. You know, um, one thing that, Trying to hate you less. We need to do (laughs) one thing we need to do is to, uh, I think, listen to jazz players and try to play jazz because, you know, really what jazz players are is they are so uh, intimately familiar with their instrument that they, whatever they can think of in their head, come, you know, they can translate immediately to play and and coming out their bell. Hmm. Um, So even if you're not very good at it, the idea that if you can hear a melody in your, in your head and then play it through the instrument right away that's that's a very good skill to learn you know mm-hmm. jazz players are composing as they're playing and like and Bach. playing yeah. composing and then playing instantaneously i mean that's that's a, that's a great skill to develop wow yeah, yeah so that connection where it's just the instrument and there's no there's no in between it's like your head your heart and then the sound right the instrument's that's just right. part of your body that's yeah. right that's wow. Right. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about anxiety? Uh, I mean, I'm sure you've had like sold out, you know, arena concerts and, and stuff like that, or, or, or live television broadcasts. Did you, I mean, I'm sure you felt nervous in your own way. Or maybe it was just I feel a, very nervous. Yes, David. You're talking about memorization with David Haney, and I feel a lot of anxiety. I could talk about it. <laughs> Go ahead, David. It, memorization is not all it's cracked up to be. It really it doesn't make you play the notes any better. 
Right. Um, yeah. But um, I think what I, I came to in my own head on, in really uh, high stress performances is really essentially what Jeff uh, teaches with his fearless class is that when you walk onto the stage, you walk across the line out into the public view, you leave a lot of baggage behind you. All you can do is the best that you can do. And you, 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 are, you would like to be perfect, but we realize that nobody really is. Well, okay, maybe there's a couple, but uh, you just have to leave it off stage and do the best that you can. And that, that frees you, I think, from a lot. Also, the, the first mistake frees you a lot from uh, the anxiety. You know, you go, okay, I have not performed perfectly, so I, now I can go on and just do the best that I can. Wow. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. That's awesome. That's and that's so, and that's such a literal playing out of who you are backstage when you're practicing. I love there's a saying, prayers are rarely answered on stage. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> you know, and we'll that's never good. hear your third version. Like that that's and that good. has to be a part of every note we play backstage. The big dangerous thing is when you walk out on stage and decide this time matters more. Is what you just haven't right. made all the other times yeah. matter enough. That's you know, right. Just and get and into the- that. Yeah. And the three of us, the three of us all know that it's not that we play perfectly. It's that we cover our mistakes really well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, David, could you just tell a little, a uh, couple experiences that you might have had on tour with uh, the Canadian Brass or throughout your career? I would love to just hear like some of the, the behind the scenes interactions. I'm sure you guys had lots of fun. And, oh, we had a, yeah, we did. We had a, we had a good, uh, Great relationship. A good a good experience in um, in Empire Brass. When I was in Empire Brass, we toured in a motorhome. It was a big like uh, you know uh, motorhome, and uh, so one of our uh, one of our concerts was in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yes, it was a community concert. We played a lot of community concerts, and we we played this concert in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So generally, what we would do is we'd drive into town. We had a roadie. We'd drive into town and we'd uh, scope out where the high school was or if, or if that was where we were going to play. And then we'd go to our hotel and unpack and get, get showered and get ready for dinner and then go to the concert. So this particular day, we headed into town mid-afternoon. We found out where the high school was and then we went to our hotel. And as we were uh, disembarking from the, uh, the motor home, uh, a couple of couple of police uh, came up to us and asked us to stay in the van, looking slightly threatening, and uh, asked us for all our IDs so that we would uh, could identify ourselves. And so we did that. We got back in the van. We looked out the window and we saw that around the ridge there were police cars with rifles trained on us. So this was <laughs> kind of exciting. So after fi- after five minutes, and they had uh, checked our licenses and they checked our IDs, and um, came back and uh, to us to tell us that we were free to go. They stopped us because they were there were cop killers in the area, and all they knew that they were in a vehicle with Boston plates on it, with Massachusetts plates on it. Wow. <laughs> So, and you had lots of like gun cases, like from The Godfather. Right. They, they thought they were in case. Yeah. Sweating like for the storm. That was David, close, it, that seemed, was it seems like the police follow you in quite a few places. My sister Lisa tells a story in Amsterdam where the police were <laughs> running around. Was that you in this concert? Where they chased a guy over the stage through the concert hall? And there was a thief. Maybe well, you weren't the harness at that point, were you? I don't, I don't remember that. Okay, I don't think Lisa, that was me. Okay, there's a, a, a concert transition. in Amsterdam where a, where a thief ran in and over the stage, and you guys just kept playing, and two policemen went up and over <laughs> after them, and it just kept think, on going. I, I think I heard that story from Lisa, but I don't think I was the horn player. Or you were so focused, you didn't notice. Yeah, you so, <laughs> yeah. Dave, what was your um, time like overseas, like abroad? What was your first concert like in Japan? I'm sure like it must have been really interesting traveling without uh, Wi-Fi or the internet or, you know, like translation yeah. devices. How did you navigate through some of these countries that didn't, you know, maybe like they weren't all instantly fluent in English? 
the Japanese concerts, uh, well, I first went over to Japan with Boston Symphony and, and of course, uh, there's no, no, no interaction necessary in that regard. But when, when you go as a brass group, they, they identify much more strongly with that because a lot of them play really well and they play in brass quintets and they play in woodwind quintets and, and um, th their, their musical training is a very, as a very high level. So the, the personality cult is, is much stronger. And I think Empire is still going to Europe. Uh, wow. mm. uh, it's not, uh, um, you know, it's, music can be a language unto itself. And so the playing is a kind of a substitute for the lack of language skills. Um, I found mm. that it was, I never had a problem connecting with players over there as long as we had the music in common. Wow. There's a, a question from uh, online Cameron Ray. Hi, Cameron. How you doing? Nice to see you on here. Uh, he asks you to talk about the horn balancing it within a quintet and the role role of that and the use of what's uh, important about the horn. When yeah, well, you can, you can speak to that too. I would just tell you that I, I always considered that the horn in a brass quintet was kind of like the meat in a sandwich. You know, you're kind of the middle part in you contribute a lot to the general breadth and depth of the of the sound of the overall sound of the group and uh it's it's uh it's kind of funny because uh, i i did a lot of woodwind playing but when i was freelancing and and uh, before i got into boston symphony and i would characterize it by saying you know in, in a woodwind quintet you can't generally can't play loud enough but in a what did I say woodwind no in a brass quintet you generally can't play loud enough and in a woodwind quintet you generally can't play soft enough so you have that that dichotomy oh yeah woodwind group there we are who's the bassoonist that's your sister <laughs> that's your sister yeah um it's uh it's it's uh, it's a different kind of playing than orchestral playing because you need to put out more core of sound. I think you need to put out put out more core of sound to be more of a soloist kind of a, a voice than a orchestral voice. Um, uh, again, a fine difference, but it's something that, having spent a lot of my career in a in a brass group. Uh, it's something that you think about. Great time now to be able to do that with all the recordings you can play along with too. You know, Dale Clevenger in his teaching, yeah. he says, you don't have to do it this way, but you have to be able to do it this way. Mm -hmm. Sort of mix it up and do as oh, much yeah. chair music as possible. It's been, I'm sure all three of our experiences getting to be able to do whatever we want musically Absolutely. in our careers eventually, yeah. or just yeah. for the enjoyment of it. So there's Dave? a ton of Canadian brass Dave? music out there to do. And Could I ask you a little bit about your horns, like what horns you played, like yeah. uh, throughout your career, and what uh, your favorites were? I played. Uh, well, I was a clinician for I think five different instrument companies through my career, so I play. I play anything that they paid me to play. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and you can make them all sound great. You know, well, that's just a, a, basically like a, a statement to say, "Hey, it doesn't matter what horns in your hand, as long as you're comfortable with it and you know what you want to say." You know, that was an interesting part that sort of relates to the, my upbringing, too, with respect to the uh, orchestral playing of the time. Like, uh, you know, uh, there was this, uh, the 8D was ubiquitous. The Con 8D was ubiquitous. Um, they played it in New York. They played it in, you know, them in Cleveland. They played them in, uh, uh, in Philadelphia, except I think Mason played a, played a, a, a Crosby but most of the other players played played eight Ds there. Dave, that was Dave, the if you ask a question, you should stay for the answer. Dave, can you, can you please? <laughs> I'm getting my charge cord, my max wow. today. <laughs> um, but I I uh, I I played. Uh, I was clinician for Holton, Khan, for Box Selmer, for Yamaha, and for the Canadian Brass Line when we were when we were making our own instruments for a while there. Um. What do I like? I like an 8D. I, yes. I must say, that's still the great American French horn to me. Do you still have one? 
No, I don't have any horns now anymore. You don't have, okay. So, I mean, that's the thing is like, we always look to like you guys is like, oh man, you know, once I get to this level, man, I'm going to like be playing like awesome. And, you know, I don't think I'd ever want to stop playing the horn. You've, you've played with all the groups you played all over the world. And I, I don't think I'd want to stop. And do you still play? No, I don't play. Okay. What? I, I have mean, a great story about that. We were, we were here at Christmas time and uh, it's on the back of the mic. I'm being told I'm over modulating. Okay. Hi. Uh, we're figuring out all this technology. How do I turn it? Oh, there we go. Can you still hear me? David, can you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good. So we're on the back porch here at Christmas time, and David and I might be having a cigar. We're, of course, you don't inhale. It's just, and we're uh, with. Uh, winter mittens on and and we're talking and we talked about I think David and I had both played in a Bruckner 7 right with Boston yeah. Symphony yeah, that's wow. and, yeah. and uh and I said hey, so David do you play anymore and he said you know I did for a long time and then you know he'd play a Glier concerto every three months or six months and you got to get ready for that I think is part of it but the way he said this is just beautiful so I, I would love to share it that I said you know do you play anymore and David said you know we did that Bruckner, Boston, that summer, and I put the horn in the corner, and I said, okay, I'll come for you if you call loudly enough, and it never called. <laughs> he just smiled, and we went on and talked about other things, talked about model planes, and my yeah. niece and nephew that they're with, you know, yeah, yeah. it's such a beautiful way to, to embrace other things, and we really, we talked about his other pursuits, he's an audiophile, so he's into really exotic speaker wires, whatever that means. Yeah. Wow. I, th I, I, I think that's true. I remember that, Jeff. And I, I also would put it a different way, is that uh, having uh, achieved a high level on the horn, um, uh, I know what I can do and I know how much time it takes. And I don't want to spend the time anymore. And I don't, mm. want to warm, I don't want to warm up for 15 minutes in the morning and pretend that I'm still a horn player. Wow. I did it and I was chained to it for many years and I was able to lay it down at, at age 60. Isn't that every musician's dream? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. To, to walk away while you can still play. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, it was mine and I was able to achieve it. Dave, could you give us a little bit of uh, inspiration for the younger players right now who might not have ensemble playing, who might not have like lessons, uh, like what can they be doing to like keep their chops up? What can they be doing to like, you know, really still stay engaged and, you know, have goals? What kind of goals can they set for themselves while they're off for these three months? It's been a long time since I've taught, Dave. And it's, uh, the, the uh, again, I would get back to saying, if you are an instrumentalist and you need a target, that you need to listen to recordings, you need to listen to other players and find players that you really admire, that you respect and that you appreciate and try to emulate what you hear there. Um, did, I, did I answer your question? I'm, I'm not Absolutely, sure. absolutely. Listen yeah, more. It keeps, coming, more. it keeps coming back and everyone we speak to has that to be listening to. And I think that anyone who ends up having music as a career or as a, even as a pastime or a hobby, they become experts as a result of just loving music and being able to listen to music. And now more than ever, we have more time to do that and live with that music and be making decisions about who you are as a musician. We just had Bruce Hennis visiting here. He teaches at uh, Ohio, Ohio State University, oh, yeah. uh, but played in Houston Symphony for a long time yeah. and he's amazing. But he's talked about taking that even just two seconds to think about what he called your musical blueprint. Your guy, but if you don't have an idea and you hope that blowing at the right rightly aimed lips will succeed that's just a technical success it doesn't it's not mm -hmm. a sonic success it's doing it yeah. right doesn't mean it sounds great <laughs> yeah yeah but if it sounds well, great it means you're doing it right i had a student who asked john rommel who teaches trumpet here at iu um you know can you sound great and not be doing it well or doing it right and he thought about it for a second and he said you know I think you can sound good, but you can't sound great. <laughs> and that, again, back to how good are your ears? You will never win a job better than your ears. So it's yeah. about how well and how discerning you listen. 
So I also think that, you know, uh, especially with modern technology, that you can't be 100% a performer and 100% a critic at the same time. You have to record yourself. You have to have other people listen to you and feedback. You can't just learn, you know, to, to play in a vacuum. You need to play for yourself by via a tape recording or some kind of a recording, or you need to play for other people and get feedback and people that you respect and that will tell you the truth. Yeah, this that reminds me, sorry, David, once there's a reminds me of something our mother said from her vo voice teacher, which was if you're listening and the audience is listening, then who's singing? So that's the big difference between practice and performance is that the, cr the critic turn it off, learn later, record yourself and learn. And so that perf that when you cross the line on stage, you're performing and you're focused on creation and adapting if something that's else is going on stage or to you. But other than that, it's it's a sh engagement in sharing. And then when you get yeah. off stage, learn and make it better. But and same equally destructive as thinking that was an awesome note. Ooh, that was really good. Wait, you're still playing, you know. So learning that presence of the d between performing and practicing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What wow. were you gonna say, Coop? Oh, I was just. I mean, I'm really engaged in like where you're like leading that conversation of like who's on stage singing, right? It's that um, balance between the performer and the, the critic and where do we leave the one and where do we pick up the other and how do you learn those so that's really and how well question. can you be a constructive critic you yeah. know the the success collecting is a big part of you know what we worked on together right Coop, yes all yeah. that. Magic how you perform say say something you did well and then get to yeah. what we all do really well which is what sucked i mean what could what sorry constructive language what could suck less uh, <laughs> Yeah, hey, I, have a, I have a question for you, David. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, we don't have time for that. We, it's just like <laughs> your, we, you, we're the questioners here, okay. David. We're losing control. Let me, yes. Um, as a state, as a sort of state of the art uh, orchestra and state of the art orchestral player, do you? Um, uh, oh, I got to go. Sorry, I got to push low power mode here. My phone is dying. Um, do you? Um, uh, can you talk about how you? Uh, uh, c connect verbally with your colleagues as well as musically? I mean, that is to say, like, do you guys talk about concept and about note lengths and about um, getting into each other's sound? And, and how, yeah. how does that work? I mean, how do you make the product better as a result of that kind of Man. interaction? I mean, I'm, I'm so lucky to be in the Chicago Symphony with so many great uh, mentors. Uh, I've got, you know, Jim Smelser sitting next to me and Jim uh, studied with my teacher, Eric Rusk. And so Jim takes me under his wing and Jim will just say, hey, this is how we're thinking about this. You know, generally we're, and then I've got, you know, of course, Dan Gingrich, who played principal horn for six years, um, acting principal horn. And Dan will always talk about um, taking more and like listening around, right? and then like and then asserting myself less so and trusting everyone around me more so he just says like listen to what other people are doing imitate more and then you know and try to um see if you can blend more and um and then of course esteban and i were new to the orchestra esteban and i have started uh, about the same time and it's really great to have like a, a new enthusiastic principal trumpet um, who is like uh, coming up and finding his way at the same time that you are. So mm -hmm. it's really nice. We're also good friends. So when I hear something or he hears something, he says, hey, David, um, could we try this note a little bit longer? I say, absolutely. Or I say, hey, maybe like, could we try phrasing to this note? And so you've got um, these two young guys who are kind of like, all right, we're going to try to approach this in a similar way. And we discuss it. And it's so nice to have that uh, communication on stage but mm. um sometimes yeah i feel like um that's not always the culture like the the culture is like hey like um in an orchestra you don't say those sort of things and uh we try to like you know kind of just listen right and like okay we didn't get this time but we're gonna get it next time and it's so nice to have someone who like helps me and just says right away like all right we're gonna try to do this or i'm hearing this and, uh, you know, it just makes like kind of the assimilation process in a new orchestra, like much uh -huh. more.
Do you find that the, that the uh, younger guys are more amenable to that kind of uh, talking and interacting and trying to make the product better and that the older guys are, are sort of setting their ways more or is it? Well, I, I feel that they've been doing things so well for so long and they've been doing it so long together that they don't really need to talk about it, right? There's not that need to um, say like, hey, this is what I'm trying to do because everyone's been sitting on stage and having this nonverbal dialogue for, you know, 20 hours a week for the past 20 years. So um, for Esteban and I, I find that like, hey, while we're both new, we're both kind of learning, like this is how we do things and let's get this together and let's be on the same page. I find that like he's really flexible and really like, you know, keen to like, you know, have that communication with me. And I'm so grateful for that. But I also find that the, the guys who've been in the orchestra and who are, you know, have the, all that experience are so willing to share. And they're so willing to like, kind of, you know, bring me into that tradition and bring me into that new yeah, yeah. kind of. Good. And there's probably a vibe for you to fit into that while leading as well as far as the role and the context of principal horn that's the that's the mixture and the balance that you're probably working with you know reminds me i remember and i think it was chicago that we sat down to start playing i think Mahler six or something and uh i'm sitting next to dale and and he plays and he's the conductor stops after two bars and just and i could feel the whole orchestra just go oh geez, this is gonna be a long week <laughs> like didn't even play one bar and he wants to talk so david with you asking about the dialogue all that unsaid things but then, and same with the, with the quintet, with Canadian Brass, you know, we, and I just rejoined two years ago, you know, joining with everyone else that are longtime members as well, that I fit into that while finding what the horn could say in my ways and fit with that and then balance it and find what the present group wants to be doing and prioritizes while adding what you mean and with the value that you can give along the way. So it's a lot in our group, it's a lot of playing and the group was used to living in the same city. So playing all day, every day, we would start at 10, or we'd meet for coffee. Uh, and then, so maybe nine o'clock coffee, 10.30 rehearsal till one or two, go for lunch, come back at 3.30 or four and go till six every single day. So we wow. got to play a lot and play and really learn through that experience of, as you know, David, right? And playing yeah. and listening and talk about it if it if it comes to that, you know, that's the thing I think that the sound, because we're the words are just lame, utterances of sound that symbolize meaning and emotion and all those things. The music is always better than words. However, we have words as well. So we've got to use them at times too. It doesn't make words bad or lame, but it's always, come, always comes down to the, the sound first, you know. And then also how to be polite when like, you know, communicating. I don't Whatever. just say, like, you know. Not important. Like, Not important. Hey, hey, Jeff, could you do this? Jeff, you're out of tune. Hey, Jeff. How about you know? playing in tune? You want to try something like that? Yeah. Exactly. yeah. David, can you talk about who this is on the screen? Who? I, okay, let me just look. I, I can see it on my phone. So I see you. I see my, uh, your sister, Lisa. I see Charlie Vernon. Hi, Lisa. I see um, Esteban. Z Zoltan Kiss, yeah, from uh, Minozel. Yes, Zoltan. This is when we were in from, Vienna. Uh, that was in Vienna. We met yeah. up in Vienna for this, uh, um, you know, this evening of fun and stories. There's Jay Friedman and um, Manazel Brass is, you know, one of the premier brass ensembles in the world. They don't have a horn. Nobody's perfect, right? Right. But, yeah. <laughs> we wish we wish them luck. Yeah. And then here we are. Yeah, I heard, them in, I heard them live in Boston. I heard them in Boston. They're yeah. phenomenal. I mean, yeah. and they're entertainers. They're just like, I, I feel like they're really pushing the the level of what the instruments can do. And yeah. they're just, yeah, there's so much fun. But uh, yeah, so Full of personality we, we and everything. meet up in uh, Germany and they have, or in Austria, excuse me. In and Vienna, have a yeah. really, really nice uh, dinner. We had some apple strudel there together. You, me, Chuck, uh, Brandon, Caleb. Caleb, who's coming into our talk here, I think he has to let us off of his computer or something. Oh, he does. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> he might need his computer because I couldn't figure out how to host. We have Caleb Hudson here. Hi, Caleb. Is Caleb joining us? No, I'm going to keep him muted. We don't want to. You know he plays trumpet, right? <laughs> Caleb yes. left. And he's gone. Oh, he made me the host. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So that was in a, what was that, that restaurant, David, where you were with Chuck and oh, man, that Brandon restaurant, and everybody? 
I, I don't, it's a coffee shop where Beethoven and Mozart ate. And that's yeah. like the famous apple strudel that they both enjoyed while they lived in Vienna. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like the same recipe, like the same, like everything, the same decor, probably yeah. the, you know, the same chandelier. I mean, it's just that's amazing. Like, be in the place where you know Beethoven lit, you know, yeah, that is, played. That is. I think they did the Beethoven so, quintet premiere there. Right, that's right. Man. So yeah. if you if you're wondering about music, like I grew up on a pig farm, we got like, but got to do this kind of thing, and it takes us to places like that and get to share music and wow. colleagues and longtime friends we meet up with, you know, and catch up. David, it's amazing having you on. Yeah, thank you so much story. for your time, David. My pleasure. And, and uh, it's two o'clock. So I have another appointment. So I'm going to beg off. But really okay. great to talk with you guys and really get Thank great you, David. to meet you, David. Hey, fantastic. Really nice to meet you. And I look forward to meeting you in person once we uh, can be a little closer than six feet. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. All right. Bye. Thanks, David. Bye. Bye, David. Woo. That was well, unbelievable. So inspiring. Yeah. We're still Man. live. Dave, be nice. Be well, nice. I know, I know we're okay. still alive. I mean, I just can't believe like how easy the horn is for him. It just seems like it was easy for him to memorize. It was easy for him to play. Like he won his first audition, the <laughs> assistant associate principal with the Chicago Symphony. Like this is not the review I would I'm appreciating right now, David. Let's <laughs> oh, did your phone die? No. <laughs> yeah, my my phone <laughs> my phone almost died. But man, he's just yeah, really uh, inspirational guy and uh, i mean he's done it all and he yeah. retired you know he retired while he was still at the top which is beautifully yeah yeah and what he's, Farkas and he's, did and he's well. just like and it's it, just what you do you go and you sit in that room for hours a day and you figure it out and he it never it's not a big deal to him you just get it done and get it to a certain standard and then at some point he'd had enough of keeping it at that standard and i think mm. you know after he left the brass uh he as I said, you know, doing those Glier concertos once every six months, that's a lot to get back into. I know for yeah. me, sharing this for our younger listeners as well, you know, I don't do anything without some good fear of a concert, you know, and having to do regular <laughs> concerts and staying in there. I mean, I do at time and yes, growth for growth's sake and future things. But for you guys who are studying music and wanting to do this and haven't been given that proof that you deserve it and you get to do it, it's a much potentially scarier place. But I think, yeah, for me, I, I still head down, went and did it, and I had to do something with my time, and I wanted to get as good as I could get. I focused on that. Um, when I went to the Winnipeg Symphony, it was in the third was year. It, that was your first gig, Jeff? Jeff? It was my first gig, yeah. It was in the third year of my bachelor degree at McGill in Montreal. And basically, the there was a audition uh, organization that would pay help fun trips to oh, audition. Oh, man, Canada's so I, Not amazing, yeah, Canada. Amazing. You know? Oh, yeah. what a country. So we, yeah, I know. So it paid my way from Montreal to Winnipeg, and then I was going home to Edmonton. So basically it was helping me get home. And then to my <laughs> shock, I won it. And we can talk more about these kinds of things as well, you know. And I was like, but I missed this and this, and I'll take the job. But, you know, it was so imperfect. Uh, but I, so I walked in there. And I played, and then they told me, okay, here you go, you're a professional. And I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, great, you know, and this is what a lot of, I watch my students wait for, or be, you get stuck in that student mode. But then mm -hmm. to ask yourself, could I have won that audition, and could they have been tricked, <clears throat> convinced uh, into offering me that position, unless I walked in there and played like a professional first, without being I mean, given official permission. Are you talking like imposter syndrome? Because I, I think a lot of celebrities yes. actually go through imposter syndrome. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, like, after I won Berlin, I was like, me? <laughs> like, am I really the yeah. guy for, for that job? And then, like, you know, I was sitting there, and it took me a while before I was, like, sitting on stage, like, realizing, like, hey, I'm playing this job. I'm with all these guys. I won the audition. I guess this is me, you know? And right. It, you know, of course, I didn't, you know, end up staying in Berlin, but like, at a certain point, you have to believe like, okay, like, I have what it takes. But also, now that I like, have been given this opportunity, I still have to do the responsibility of the work, you know, and yeah. it just can't, like, you're only as great as your last concert, right? 
Yeah, as far as how long that belief can last, like I still have bouts up and down per note, per phrase, per piece, per concert, per week of doubt, and then finding ways to, and then once I get some work done, I think it feels a little better, I can trust a bit more, but it is not entitled, you're not ever done that, Chase, at least I'm not, no, you're not, all of Fearless Performance stuff comes from a place of great fear and having to learn it, it's not... There well, aren't I mean, it's there. it's a little bit of ego too, right? Like when I get into sure. uh, like, man, what are people going to think about me? Like, um, am I good enough? And like, whatever, like, that's just my, all my ego talking. And right. what I just have to say is like, all right, I'm going to do the work. And when I do that work, then that's going to make me feel comfortable being on stage. And I'm not going to doubt myself because I know that I've done the best I can. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so. And within that, we find ways of walking through a balanced version of that. And you guys are doing four concerts per program. We came in baskets to do, you know, at least 40, maybe, you know, we change our program a few times a year, but we get to walk out into that laboratory and try this this time. Oh, okay, I won't do that again. But now I know I got to try it, you know, in context. So that's what's so great. I think about the one of the great things about moving online is that we can perform for each other and get that experience with the knowledge someone else is listening. And for yeah. me, whether it's one person or a thousand people, that's still me choosing for whom I choose to get nervous. You know, mm. so it's watching well, those choices. I, what you said too about yeah. like, all right, moving online, you like, look, you listed, all right, the thing about moving online now, like we've got all these different people that can listen to us. Um, how do you transfer like now, how do you feel about like uh, this time as a gift? And what are the silver linings that could come out of this coronavirus time for us? Awesome. Yeah, awesome question. I've, I've been teaching online for a long time. Okay. Uh, and I would always say that one thing, until this virus, <laughs> before that, I would say you never take an online lesson when you're in the city that the person you're having a lesson with. You know, mm. if you're in the same city, you're going to do a live lesson. Yeah. So you don't, yeah. it's unfair to compare a, a digital lesson an online lesson with a live lesson you don't do it it's, it's much more fair to compare it to no lesson at all you know and so you can maybe do 70 80 percent of what a live lesson is but live is always better great but since we're changing now we're getting we're having to do this or getting to do it depending on the assessment uh, and it's a lot of both there's a lot of tricky things about it as well but to embrace the opportunities of getting to we can only do maybe 70 or 80% of a live lesson, but we can still spend 100% on that 70% or 80% of timing and mm. ideas about training and finding other ways of, of training together. I'm doing my masterclass with my students in 20 minutes. So we're going to get into a big room and do masterclass. Fantastic. We'll have some performers, but I, we also do peer performing. And we're going to, David, we're going to be sharing all these things through our talks here and through the Canadian Brass website on how to, I, I'm going to, call, I'm calling this thing uh, peer editing. Uh, there's peer performances and there's peer forming, but this is peer editing. I, I don't know. We'll see if it lasts, but it's the it's name. Like peer, edit, um, peer editing? That's so a, it's, a, no, it's a, it's basically playing a duet. And, oh. uh, and I've done that all the time. What I've done before is if you want, if the student at the other end wants to play along, I've had like the Mozart concerti arranged, the, the orchestra part arranged for one horn. Um, and we'll make those available as well. Um, Fantastic. So I play the orchestra will part. Be, or I play the, will that be available on your website? It is available on my website, and yeah, and we're going to put it through Canadian Brass website as well. Hey, yeah. fantastic. Wow, I look forward to those. Cause yeah. I mean, I mean, who doesn't play the Mozart horn to charity? I mean, like, right. all of yeah. us. And to play those other melodies, that some of them we don't ever get to play. They're not in the horn part. It's so yeah. great. The slow movements, amazing duets. But so I either play the orchestra part, and then I kind of ignore what's coming back because of the lag on online mm -hmm. lessons. But the person at the other end, the student, they just hear my, my sound coming to them and they play along. For them, it's a full on experience of playing together. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've, I'm doing with my students and I recommend our listeners to pass along. I'll make a document explaining it, but you just, you basically, you scan a, I mean, you both buy the same duet book and um, one, one person plays it and shuts their speakers off. And the person yeah. at the other end plays along with the sound and then you take turns. So we could play duets all day. I couldn't play wow. duets when I was growing up. My sisters were playing their scales on their flutes and bassoons. So. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. Well, Jeff, yeah. um, I guess lastly, like... Um, How about you though, David, on the opportunity? On opportunity. 
the online I mean, stuff. So you're you're doing so many great online things now. I'm just trying know. to reach out, right? I'm just trying to be of service and I'm trying to connect, right? Uh, I have this gift of time and I feel like um, oftentimes I've been a little bit limited as like to how much uh, I put out because of how much time I have or because, you know, I'm really fulfilling, you know, my obligations with the symphony. But now that I have this gift of time, I want to have conversations with my friends, have conversations with, you know, um, my heroes and the people that have really helped me and just try to like bring that to people that might not have access to them. And then I also want to start donating my time uh, to do like online master classes and online lessons. So I'm going to be doing those like on Instagram live or Facebook live, just like giving free lessons and free master classes to people that want to join in. We'll do like a regular afternoon master class and, and then, you know, people can hear my experience and, you know, hopefully learn something from me. Awesome. But, Thank you. Um, so on that note, <laughs> as someone who have wanted to, to see your last few classes on Instagram live, but couldn't, and I really, I'm pretty tech savvy it's all relative i'm sure my canadian breast colleagues are laughing at me right now but uh i can't figure out how to see them on instagram i looked at instagram live so how do you and i even looked on the what's called the google i know what the google is uh how to watch instagram live and it still doesn't work so when you go on instagram uh, i mean they're they're i can explain this to you again a little bit more detail what do you mean again he didn't tell me (laughs) i'm just saying go ahead so did you have Instagram downloaded work. on your phone? Did you get the app? Well, you don't have to talk slower. I he, I understand the words. They just don't work for me. Yes. <gasps> okay. So you basically Wait, just... Sorry, what? <laughs> was it Instagram Live? Is you go, it, you go into app? Instagram and then you'll click on my uh, face icon. Like, so you'll see me in front of the Chicago flag. I know what an icon is. Thank you. And yes. so you just click on my icon and it'll bring up my interview. Um, it's actually up there all day long. Um and it's on, uh, yeah, my story. So you just watch my story. So okay. go to the top. Please, everyone, please everyone uh, try that. And if it doesn't work, please message me so I feel better. Because I've tried that. Anyway, I'll see. Yay. We're going to we're gonna work on getting these up on YouTube. I think I need to switch platforms. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah cool. I think, yeah, I think that's just maybe a better platform for these. Yeah. Yay. So, wow. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Hang. Thank sorry, you very much. We more more time to answer more questions, but we're going to be doing these every week, right? Right. Yeah, every week yep. on every Fridays. Week, 1 we're going to advertise Friday. whether it's at twelve thirty or one p.m. We might change to twelve thirty to keep twelve thirty is great. A week. Yeah, I normally will be. And you can have your lunch hour. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Lunch hour. lunch hour with Jeff and Coop. Yeah. 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 Hey, thank questions you very coming, much, everybody. Thank, thank you so much so for much. being here. Was, yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. Who's our guest great. next week? Do we have a Do we have a guest lined up? I've spoken to a few people, but I haven't heard back yet. So we'll see. Yeah. Oh, but it's a surprise. Be, we're gonna we're we're gonna share it and you sooner a, than you have yesterday. a magic trick for us next week too, right? <laughs> sure, I have one now. If you want, you got five seconds. Can, 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 yeah. Can you can you show us a magic trick really quick? Okay. Ready? Remember that card I told you to pick? Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mute for that part. In every deck of cards, there are four of everything: four twos, four sevens, four jacks. These are the four jacks, okay? David, are you there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> so focused. <laughs> Out of the four jacks, two red ones and two black ones. Yes. This is totally up to you. Which ones would you like to keep? The red ones okay. or the black ones? Can I say it? Please, it's a better trick. The black if, ones. Yeah. <laughs> the black ones, okay. So I'll give you, there's the spade and there's the club. In here, we remain the hearts and the diamonds, right? Jack of hearts, jack of diamonds. Before you pick whichever one you want to keep, that leaves one remaining here, and that one will turn over in its grave as a neglected child. I remember I asked Dale Clevenger's daughter, which do you want to keep, the diamond or the heart? And she says, story of my life, honey. (laughs) 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 So which would you like to keep, the diamond or the heart? Let's go with the diamond. You diamond okay so in here we have four cards and the heart will be what ended up being neglected which one is that oh there it is it's on the bottom that's why it's upside down that's amazing man now it also we knew it was going to be that so it was from a different color deck and the other three cards (laughs) <laughs> oh my god. 
Ta-da! Yay! We did not talk. Now, that's one of our rules. We can't talk about these tricks. I sent you some magic tricks to learn. You were on next week. You're going to do a magic trick for next week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll see me disappear. That'll be my trick. <laughs> yeah. That's one of the things growing up, like magic's the same as music, right? You work on the techniques and you do it. But like what I just did was kind of just a trick, you know, like I did the techniques and it's kind of cool. Same as playing an instrument well. But I still, you know, I need to add more story to this trick and, and add some, you know, tension and, re- and some maybe some mysterious characters or something and then it's then it's magic i just did a trick so it's wow. identical it's really cool wow. thank yeah. you so much jeff yeah man a, thank you thank wonderful. you everybody we'll see you we'll see you next week so the rest of the week we have coming up tomorrow saturday two o'clock the uh, canadian brass trumpets are hanging out with mark gould um and he was in that same concert with the boston symphony and the new york philharmonic brass sections played with canadian brass it's on the it's on youtube as well on kevin all the people we talked about first one in boston kevin um and david mark gould and all these guys so they're going to talk tomorrow at two o'clock on facebook canadian, the same canadian brass page and then we have i think it's tuesday trombones with gene watts and achilles achilles is going to co-host with with gene it's going to be amazing uh wednesday all of canadian brass will be back doing our thing uh, 12, 1230. And then Thursday's Chuck tuba with Jarrett, um, young, phenomenal tuba player playing all over the place. And he's awesome. And then back here Friday for you and me again. Fantastic. Doing... See you yeah. soon, Jeff. Thanks everybody. Yeah, you too. Thank you everybody. Bye.